Well, the main intention behind uh, convening this workshop was uh, the need to draw attention to the fact that the uh, recent discussion around uh, human chain line chain editing was too much focused on uh, the health aspects uh, of target effects of the technology and uh, we thought that uh, yeah this was a too narrow perspective and there was a need to enlarge to broaden the analysis and to consider also so societal issues um, the risk uh, of um, allowing a technique uh, that may be used for eugenic or enhancement uh, purposes to consider also societal concerns, values, human rights issues, uh, social uh, justice, equality issues, et cetera, et cetera. This, uh, so the, this uh, technology raises uh, much uh, broader uh, concerns than just the immediate uh, health related uh, risks. Um, so that was the, the main uh, motivation. Um, and uh, so we thought, or at least I, I think that uh, in the end, the, the fundamental question be, before discussing about the health uh, uh, risks is uh, whether we really want as a society to uh, a future uh, where uh, children are genetically designed by their parents. So do we really want that? That's the question uh, that should be discussed uh, before any other, any other issue. And, uh, and obviously scientists are not uh, uh, competent to decide alone uh, about this. Is, this concerns all of us as a society. So this was an opportunity to bring to pay, together people who were very knowledgeable about the issue, about its social uh, consequences, about the policy um, landscape, people who have been following the issue, but who haven't really, um, for the most part, been able to get their concerns and perspectives really into the mainstream of the controversy about heritable genome editing. and had become increasingly troubled that this perspective was um, was largely missing. So we brought together this group and um, we really uh, took as our task um, mapping out what the human rights and social justice perspective on heritable genome editing is. As a legal scholar, I would say, I would like to say a few words about uh, this legal uh, uh, element of the, this not just uh, ethical debate it's also legal it's about rights it's about the integrity of uh, future generations and um, the point is that uh, s since the end of the 90s there was uh, a, cons a consensus a global consensus reflected in for instance uh, UNESCO declarations and other international mm -hmm. documents uh, about the need to prevent the alteration of the, of the human gem line. And uh, there were many also domestic laws adopted in those years. And the, the question is that <laughs> these uh, regulations are still in place. Um, and the current debate uh, gives the impression that uh, there's nothing, that this is uh, an entirely new issue. So, um, uh, sometimes these uh, documents, legal documents, are totally ignored or downplayed. One of our hopes of bringing together this group was to kind of model um, a different kind of conversation about mm -hmm. whether heritable genome editing should go forward. So we did have scientists in the room, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the conversation at the Brochet Foundation at our workshop was not dominated by scientists. Mm -hmm. We also had uh, scholars from other disciplines, social sciences and humanities. Mm -hmm. We had legal scholars, people who um, have studied policy, international policy, public policy. And we had civil society advocates, importantly, um, 
And I think you know, that's the kind of conversation that we have in mind when we hear about the call for broad and inclusive public participation mm -hmm. or broad mm -hmm. societal consensus. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, um, one of the points that we think this workshop and this statement make importantly is that it really takes, it does take resources and it does take work mm -hmm. to have the conversations that, that everyone is mm -hmm. calling for. And yet it's so it's it's recognized as so important because the decision we make about whether we should be moving forward towards CRISPR babies for inheritable genome editing, it really has the potential or, or the likelihood of reshaping a lot of social relations, both at the level of the family and at the larger larger level of the kinds of society we live in. Are we going to exacerbate the inequalities and disparities and discrimination that we already Absolutely. live with? Absolutely. Or are we gonna close the door on that and use these powerful scientific tools to help people who are mm -hmm. sick mm -hmm. rather than trying to engineer the traits of future generations? The way that we look at science and approach certain values, um, the words that we use are dominated um, and have been dominated by a particular agenda. And even the way that we talk about social justice considerations, or we talk about what the law requires or prohibits, um, all of these words, um, we, we have a certain lens of viewing them, um, of thinking that um, more technology is a good thing. It has really been, up to this point, driven by the technological imperative. That is to say, um, it certainly has a set of built-in assumptions that uh, technologization is always a good thing and that scientists know best and public should just follow along and that this course tends to rule out certain ways of talking about the subject. In particular, it tends to rule out the big social questions like eugenics, which scientists, they hate that word, they don't want to discuss it, um, and they certainly don't want it to be included in official reports. Human genome editing is an issue touch everyone, and it's about our common um, heritage and um, genetic heritage. And it's not only concerning people of this generation, it's concerning people of next generation. So this is an issue, of course, it should not be decided merely by policy makers and um, experts and scientists, and should be discussed, debated, and decided uh, by uh, by the society. So that is a quite crucial point, really, to have an adequate public debate and make a really uh, wise decision collectively. And th then this needed to my second reason. This uh, deliberation should not merely occur just in one or some countries or like just Western countries. It should be uh, debated globally in every society. It was um, fortuitous that we all came together to make this statement um, as the same time um, that there was an attempt um, uh, to actually create children with um, modified genomes. And so I think that this um, number one shows that if the technology is available, um, that scientists um, will attempt to use it and to implement um, these types of radical, experimental, and risky technologies. Um, so I, I think the time was exactly right to, um, to gather together um, and, and look at um, what is it that we have to say right now? And I think what, um, what is important about um, uh, our particular statement um, that exists independent of time 
um, as, as a second point is that there are a number of issues that our statement brings up that are not limited to safety or feasibility. Because I know that these issues um, we've written about before, including myself, um, but the issues that we bring up with this statement are much broader than that. And it gets to the heart of even if somehow magically um, somebody proclaims that it is now safe and feasible, there are still all of these other issues left over um, that those types of statements wouldn't even touch. Um, so I think that's, that's what is important about this. Between 2015 and the end of, uh, end of 2018, the reports that came out kind of created a, a illusion almost that we are discussing whether gene editing would be a good path forward in human reproduction. Whereas as we have experienced now, facts <laughs> matter and the tide has turned after the birth of the first children who have been genetically modified. And apparently many groups and people are rather comfortable with the thought that the question is not whether, but how and under what conditions. And that narrows the public discourse to these questions. And the initial open deliberation is silently taking off the table. As a member of a civil society organization, um, I think this timing of uh, this statement to us was very important because what happened uh, after the announcement of the birth of those children in China was that um, a whole, uh, over a hundred uh, signatories from different um, civil society groups around the world immediately reacted and came forward and said, no, we have to stop this. At the very least, we need a, uh, an immediate moratorium, uh, something that the organizers of the summit in, uh, in China actually refused to, uh, to agree with. Um, but this statement, I think, uh, does a lot to uh, you know, put forward that, that civil society view that you can't just let this slide forward and gradually happen uh, without us deciding, uh, you know, whether or not we want it to happen. Yeah, it's, um, it is indeed quite important to really um, look into this much broader and the sweeping uh, social political forces, which has been um, shaping the development of biotechnology including uh, home, uh, gene editing technology and as well as our responses uh, to them and use them. An example of Ch uh, China uh, is in the Chinese context, Ho Jianghui's experiment would never be possible without the eugenics context in China. And of course, those um, it's not merely China. That those ideological, a lot of different interests and the interests of the state, interests of uh, uh, different institutions, interests of groups and the financial interest and other, many, many other interests, all are part of those pictures. Now it's really high time we really carefully examine those deeper and the far more forceful uh, social political factors. And uh, those, once again, uh, it, China's um, practice and the background are always part of it globally. So once again, we need um, looking at those uh, social political forces uh, in a global perspective, rather than just isolated in a particular country. It is so important not just to presuppose a Western understanding of eugenics, but also to, to look from different perspectives and um, what is happening, what, is, what, what has changed too 
uh, over the last three, four, five years in different countries with um, uh, certainly um, a new surge of, of racism and so on. And um, the, to gain a broader perspective that situates and locates the gene editing question in the bro broader context, instead of doing it the other way around, first focus on, on, on this um, kind of decision or choices from a technological and then social and ethical perspective and then contextualize it. I think that that is the effort that we made to turn it around and come from a social, political, uh, legal and ethical perspective and situate the gene editing question on human embryos within this broader context. And yet we pretend that, that uh, the gene editing can be, can be regulated in a way uh, that um, it kind of avoids all the social ills that, that we have seen all along. And the historical sensitivity and awareness is certainly a very important part of it, but history is not just the past. History is also kind of an undercurrent that may or may not continue in the present. You know, one of the things um, that really is unique about this statement that, you know, all of you have been referencing, um, it really does, you know, first say that we need to recommit to the idea of having broad and inclusive public debate um, of heading towards this goal of, of broad societal consensus. And, but not just stopping there saying, you know, what do we really need to do to get to that point? It's time to start moving towards making those conversations and those public deliberations happen. So the statement tries to identify what some of the things are that need to happen in order to have meaningful public deliberation, including talking about um, historical and social context and concerns, right? C correcting some of the misrepresentations that have taken hold in the conversation so far, and really laying out some criteria for, um, for what an, an empowered public conversation would, would look like. We first have to take off the table some serious misrepresentations that have been forwarded or um, disseminated over the last few years. And I would just like to, to um, um, call out a few of those. Yeah? The first one is right from the beginning that there was and is no uh, guiding regulatory framework. That was not true and is not true. There are laws, there are guidelines, there are regulations in place, but they were not referenced until people came up and, and pointed to them. The second is that the gene editing on human, re, uh, and human embryos has no alternatives. Again, people had to point out, out that is not true and we do that in our statement. Then there is a misrepresentation that the implementation or application could be limited to medical purposes, but we say that the separation between medical application and enhancement has never been easy. And of course, that has led over the last years to the point that enhancement now is on the table, which it was not in the beginning of the, of the discussion. So there is a bunch of questions that we first have to take off the table again before we even can think about how we can structure or relaunch the public discussion and debate about the gene edi editing uh, on, on uh, embryos for reproductive reasons. I'm in complete agreement. Um, I, I think it's absolutely necessary that we clarify a lot of these misconceptions. And I think um, uh, in, in agreement again, that one of the biggest ones this um, this notion of therapeutic misconception that it's addressing an, an an unmet medical need that it's a certain cure for all sorts of things from from serious genetic disease to infertility um, to to all of these 
problems that um, that should garner sympathy in our society, but it's not. And so not only is the scientific evidence not there, but this framing it in, um, in these types of terms and pushing it um, uh, in this light that it's this um, cure that's going to help all of these families have healthy babies um, is not only disingenuous, but it really is disempowering to the public. Recently, um, I was at a conference in London of, uh, of many of the scientists who are part of a, an international commission that has been set up uh, to look uh, into uh, basically how we can do this and how we can regulate it. So they've kind of already made their decision. I, mean, I was very struck by the difference between um, the scientists who uh, you know, are very keen on the technology and the clinicians who, de who deal with families with genetic diseases on an everyday basis. And the clinicians were, were completely clear that there really is no need uh, for this technology. Uh, they ha already have all the technologies uh, that they need uh, to, to avoid the birth of children with serious genetic disorders. Um, and it makes me wonder what is going on with the scientists that despite the fact that there's no medical, uh, no medical need for it, um, that there's still this kind of kind of robotic push, 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 we must do this, we must do this. I would say one of uh, uh, main challenges uh, uh, for uh, developing a robust uh, global public discussion is that uh, how to find uh, adequate channels for the silent and the silenced majority to speak out, to express the concerns, how, how to find that adequate channels for those groups and those uh, disadvantaged group and um, silent group mm. to come up, to participate, to be part of that uh, global um, public debate. I think that there's a very great unwillingness amongst um, the, the kind of circles that produce the official reports and the scientists and their uh, committees um, to talk about the history of eugenics. We talk about eugenics as uh, oh, it was a bad thing that happened in the past and maybe it'll happen, happen again uh, in the future, but it's actually happening now. So I think it's, this statement is really important in actually opening up the, uh, the fact that eugenics is a reality. Um, and we have to really deal with that. And, you know, especially given the uh, you know, the social and political changes and the rise of right-wing authoritarianism and racism in the last few years, uh, and that becomes even a sharper concern. So I, I really think it's important that this statement openly talks about that. So what are some of the challenges and what are the things that we need to move towards um, empowering the public? How do we make sure that uh, these calls for public discussion don't turn into sort of top-down exercises with with predetermined endpoints that are that are meant to produce acceptance rather than to um, elicit, you know, really broad and inclusive deliberation. One aspect that strikes me as wonderful is um, uh, different from the more common practice, which is have a statement to put it there and call upon for people to respond. And actually, there might be something more active going to the community, going to the groups to really actively engage in, actively uh, to have consultations. Uh, this could be done actually even in internationally. I'll just say something about the question of uh, disability, which uh, is certainly 
uh, barely included in the in the public debate. Um, and uh, the fact that many disabled people feel that uh, the general assumption that is there in uh, in uh, all of the, uh, the the official debate on this subject that uh, that we of course want to avoid the birth of disabled people. Many disabled people feel that that is, you know, highly disrespectful to them, negates their very existence, um, and uh, is an example of 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 a mindset that uh, you know many scientists and many other people have inherited um, from, uh, you know, from the world, from the, the whole past of our, of our societies and attitudes towards disabled people as, as being either a tragedy or a burden or something evil even. Um, and uh, it's really vital in my opinion that the public debate that happens around uh, this whole issue includes very strongly uh, up front the voice of uh, the voices of disabled people. One piece of this that uh, has really been absent from other statements and from discussions so far is the importance of bringing organized civil society into these conversations and deliberations to really um, you know, go to the groups that are already engaged in the kinds of um, social issues of inequities and oppressions that we think are definitely intersecting with the way that this technology might be deployed. So um, bringing those groups in that, that already are engaging the public and engaging in um, discussions of these questions is really a crucial resource for uh, broadening the um, the public deliberations and you know as the uh, the 2018 civil society statement shows right these groups are engaged and and have things to say um, about this issue. Um, I'd just like to um, make one more point, uh, if I could, about issues that are not discussed as part of the um, official ethics discussion and. Um, in fact, that's sadly not even uh, appearing in this statement, so, um, but I would have liked to have seen it there, which is the whole question of, um, of designer babies. Uh, that phrase uh, was used, uh, developed in the, in the 1980s, um, uh, and it was uh, about raising the issue about what, do you, what does it mean to actually start designing our own children? And what does that turn them into when we, we make our children just another designed object like our computers and our refrigerators and our phones. Um, what does that do to the fundamental status of human beings? I would like to echo that and, and uh, relate it to a framework or a convention that we have, namely the uh, Convention of Human Rights of Children. And you know, the international community has spent decades of discussions what exactly are the rights of children. It is a basic freedom not to be commodified, not to be objectified, not to be reified by, by other people, whether it is parents or social groups or um, political agendas or something. If we take away this very, very basic freedom, of the most vulnerable human beings we can think of, namely children at the beginning of their life, I think it takes away a building block of the human rights regime that should be troublesome for us. I'd, I'd like to turn us to this final question of, of what we would really like to see next, what we hope this statement will achieve, um, and I will start us off by just saying the simple fact that we hope that this statement will be read far and wide, that it gets out there to as many people as possible and um, can be a first step in sort of broadening the public conversation and deliberation about that. And that's also why we're so glad that we're able to publish it open access um, with the support of the Brochet Foundation. We also think that this statement 
provide support for understanding why we need at least a moratorium on this technology to take the space and the time to address all of these questions um, and, and that this statement shows us the reasons for needing that and why we must have a moratorium at this point. I, I very, very strongly uh, echo the need at least as the minimum um, of a moratorium that we can support with the other groups who have called for a moratorium and certainly uh, we are willing to collaborate with um, the groups from the WHO because there's some overlap and with the expert groups and with the bioethics groups that are uh, working here and there we're not I think when our intention is not to juxtapose us to them overall, but rather to to shift the perspective. So my hope is that that it creates a forum for people who have had no voice here, uh, brings to the table some some very very short information that one can then build upon, and perhaps also builds bridges to those members in the committees who might be more uh, open to to relaunch the public deliberation and public discourse that so far has been more used as a rhetorical phrase than as a as a, a real strategy that that is then being implemented <laughs>